I heard this morning um, a, a sort of pyramidal uh, set of presentations starting at the most abstract level with uh, the large-scale information policies of the United States, moving in through the, with Dick Tanner's wonderful presentation, the history of uh, access to legal materials in the United States, uh, David Levy's uh, salutary set of uh, cautions about the kinds of things that would have to be dealt with, and finally Carl talking about the promise of law.gov. Um, in the afternoon, um, we're dealing again with a set of um, uh, perspectives that I think really add to uh, our conversation. First, uh, Jennifer Jenkins, who's the director of our Center for the Study of the Domain, <coughs> is going to be talking about assertions of copyright uh, over state laws, state statutes, state decisions. And for many people, this is the most shocking idea, the idea that states could actually claim that the law uh, is, is copyrighted this morning. Uh, Carl talked about um, nationalizing the law. The, some people had the fear that this was nationalizing the law, making it publicly available. Of course, for it to be nationalized, you'd first have to assume that it was private to begin with. Um, and uh, some states actually make that assertion. Um, um, Jennifer will tell you uh, a little bit of the background, um, a background that stretches over 100 years of the legal history of assertions, uh, dealing with assertions of copyright over the law. Um, and then uh, we're moving in. Are we going straight to... David after that? No, and, and are, are we? To Eric. Oh, I, I have Eric. Eric has scheduled me after me. Do, yeah. you, do you want to change it around? Doesn't matter. Okay. I, I just, okay. have, I just yeah. have to be out of here at 3 o'clock. Okay. Um, so that should still be fine. Um, so then we'll be uh, moving to um, Erica Wayne, who's uh, been uh, leading um, the initiatives to establish a national inventory of legal materials. Erica joins us from Stanford, uh, Dean Levy's former law school. Uh, we're very, very glad to have her here. Thank you so much. Um, and this, I think, deals with many of the issues that Carl was talking about, which is what actually uh, counts as primary legal materials. And first of all, in order to figure out, uh, to gather everything together, we actually have to know what everything is, uh, identifying that. And that's a, um, a fascinating project in its own right. Um, and then we move to um, David Ferriero, our uh, former colleague uh, here at Duke. Uh, head of uh, uh, the Duke Libraries, head of the MIT Libraries, head of the New York Public Libraries, and now head of the country, I gather, uh, <laughs> at least. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you realize there's only the United Nations after this, Vatican. right? <laughs> Vatican. Vatican, okay. <laughs> um, th their archives have stuff you don't want to know I'm about. Not in about the the <laughs> I'm not talking about the archives. Oh, the whole thing. Oh, just the, okay. Um, so um, uh, David, uh, uh, who has uh, uh, led a series of impressive efforts uh, while National Archivist, is going to talk a little bit about um, uh, what this, uh, these whole sets of initiatives look like from the perspective uh, of the archives of the United States. This goes a lot to some of the issues both of access but also of preservation, which we were discussing in the morning, because after all, it's not enough to make things open. Uh, the question is, how will they remain open? How will they be indexed? Will they be findable? Will they be readable? Will the formats be the same? And so forth. And, um, and we also have um, uh, a, a dear friend, a um, uh, uh, former student, I have to say, as, this is my like, only claim to fame, is that uh, Andrew McLaughlin is one of my former students, um, uh, the uh, Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States, describes himself as Deputy Chief Nerd of the United States on his uh, Twitter account, um, former policy chief um, at Google, Andrew McLaughlin. Andrew um, is uh, someone who's really working in the trenches to deal with the question of um, what would open government, uh, access to uh, open governmental records mean in the United States and how could it be uh, made to work. So he's really someone who's dealt with these issues day to day and dealt with um, the problems on the larger scale. Uh, Dean Levy provided the uh, problems on the judicial scale. Um, I think Andrew can give us a sense of the problems on the, the national scale. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Jenkins. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jamie. Surely you have other claims to fame. <laughs> um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks to all of the presenters this morning, Professor Boyle, Dean Levy, Dean Danner, Carl Malibu, for fascinating presentations. Um, Dick took us on a journey through history, and I'm going to take a glimpse back into history by starting with a quote from 1886 by a district court in Minnesota considering whether the law was copyrightable. Uh, the court wrote in eloquent 19th century language, it is a maxim of universal application that every man is presumed to know the law. And it would seem inherent that freedom of access to the laws should be coextensive with the sweep of that maxim. <clears throat> Knowledge is the only just condition of obedience. The court then took us even further back into history um, to, you know, to show that this, this tenet kind of goes without saying and explain the laws of Rome, ancient Rome, were written on tablets and posted that all might read and all were bound to obedience. 
So the question I want to ask today is in terms of public access to the law, are we less advanced in the age of the internet than in ancient Rome? My presentation will focus, as we said, on what Carl earlier today called the jaw dropper. Um, claims of state copyright over their laws, over everything from statutes and judicial opinions to regulations, ordinances, things like building codes and fire codes. Um, in April 2008, uh, a kerfuffle that Carl was involved in. The website Justia, which posts um, legal materials free online, received a cease and desist letter from the state of Oregon claiming copyright ownership in the Oregon revised statutes. Um, Carl was also posting these statutes on publicresource.org, and the cease and desist letter said that the state will take any and all appropriate measures to compel your compliance with copyright law. Interesting. Is this just an Oregon thing? You know, they're usually rogue archivists. They're a rogue state. They're out west. They're like, oh, yeah, we have copyright in our statutes, but it's an anomaly. It's an outlier. No one else is going to do this. No, as Carl said earlier today, the current count is that eight states are claiming some sort of copyright over their statutes, and 21 states, correct me if I'm wrong, are asserting some sort of copyright over their administrative codes. So this is not an anomaly. And the question is, is there any legal basis for this? The U.S. Copyright Act in Section 105 explicitly excludes works of the U.S. government, the federal government, from copyright protection. So we know that federal statutes, judicial opinions, and other materials are squarely in the public domain by statute. But the Copyright Act is silent about state law. That said, courts, dating all the way back before the 1886 case that I quoted from, have repeatedly held that the law, often in quotes, the law, whether federal or state law, is not copyrightable. And they've done so for two broad and different sets of reasons. The first is the fundamental tenet or precept that I began the talk with, that citizens who are presumed to know the law and obey the law need access to the law in the first place. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. And it would be perverse to impede public access to the very laws that govern its conduct. Um, so citizens have a right of access to the law, and there are both um, First Amendment and due process constitutional implications to this. And recently, in 2002, the Fifth Circuit, in a Texas case, um, confirmed that this broad rule, this broad tenant, applies to both federal and state law. The law is the law, whether it's coming out of the federal um, or state governments. In a case called Veek versus Southern Building Code Congress International, and I will quote from the case, it traced the court's, quote, continuous understanding from 1830s to the present that the law, in quotes, whether articulated in judicial opinions or legislative acts or ordinances, is in the public domain and thus not amenable to copyright protection. And then it added, there is no reason to believe that state or local laws are copyrightable. This applies, this applies across the board. So that's the first set of arguments. The public's supposed to obey the law. Of course, they need access to the laws. How can you copyright it, restrict access, put it off limits to the public? The second set of arguments about why the law is not subject to copyright protection is more narrow, more precise, and has to do with the limits of property rights per the doctrines internal to copyright law. So as Jamie said this morning, copyright only covers original expression doesn't cover facts, the height of Mount Everest, the amount, staggering current amount of the budget deficit. It doesn't cover ideas. Freedom is good. Bacon tastes delicious and improves anything that you put it on, in my opinion. Uh, but beyond that, copyright's domain is original expression, um, the manifestation of you or me that is revealed by your expressive choices, um, whether it's my brushstrokes, my arpeggios, my, my haikus about bacon. And yes, there are a lot of haikus about bacon on the internet. Um, I've learned this recently after finding a site called the Royal Bacon Society, but I digress. That's original, that's original expression. Um, the Supreme Court has emphasized that the original expression requirement is no mere accident of the copyright statutory scheme. It is the essence of copyright and a constitutional requirement. So let's think about the law. Is the law original expression? 
Are we saying, wow, that, that guy who drafted the tax code must have a beautiful, tortured, and complicated soul. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like the opposite of an expressive choice, right? Is any, if anyone is speaking, it's the state, and as courts have noticed, by extension, the citizens, us, the people who want access to our laws. Um, and as Hobbes told us, it's not a council, the law, but a command. So seen this way, the law would seem to be at the very heart of what is not copyrightable. It's not original, it's not expressive, reflecting the expressive choices of an individual author. Um, and arguably, it's either a fact or an idea or both. And that brings us to the merger doctrine that Professor Worrell talked about earlier, where there is only one or very limited ways to express an idea or a fact, and ideas and facts are not copyrightable. Um, idea and expression become inseparable. They're merged. And so this is called the merger doctrine within copyright law. And you can't copyright that particular expression because it would circumvent the prohibition on owning facts or ideas and would effectively confer copyright over unprotectable subject matter. Um, so the V court, again, held as much. The V court was talking in that case about building codes. And it said, it should be obvious that for copyright purposes, laws are effectively facts. The US Constitution is a fact. The federal tax code is a fact. Its regulations are fact. The Texas Uniform Commercial Code is a fact. They are unique, unalterable expressions of the idea that constitute local law. Um, so the idea is that, yes, you're expressing the idea of a fact of law, but there's only one way to do it. And another court said um, it would be very difficult. An individual wishing to publish the text of a law cannot develop his own unique version and still consider it an authoritative copy. Right? You cannot express an inactive law in any other way. Expression and the fact the idea of the law merge. So one copyright tenet, law is at the heart of unoriginal expression and not copyrightable. In many cases, the states that are asserting copyright over their laws realize this. And in fact, in the <coughs> Oregon case, um, the cease and desist letter realizing that the law, the text of the Oregon revised statutes themselves itself was in the public domain, um, did not claim ownership of the underlying text, but of Oregon's particular arrangement, organization, compilation of the law. Um, because, you know, putting section numbers in numerical ascending order is, is very original. And <laughs> sorting aspects of a statute by the subject matter that they pertain to, also a very original act. I'll read, but I'll read from the cease and desist letter. So this is, this is interesting. This is a different claim, right? Okay, the law is not copyrightable, but what we're claiming copyright in is our original, unique compilation and arrangement of all these different aspects of the law into our statutory code. And so the committee said, although the committee does not claim a copyright in the text of our law itself, we do claim a copyright in the arrangement and subject matter compilation, the prefatory and explanatory notes, the le lead lines and numbering, I wasn't joking about the numbering for each statutory section, the tables, index, and annotations, and other such incidents as are the work product of the committee in the compilation and publication of original law. So the question is, now we're not talking about the underlying text, but we're talking about things like section numbers, titles, headings, page numbers. Are these original enough to be subject to copyright protection? We have Supreme Court guidance on this for um, all of you who are copyright scholars and law students. There was a Supreme Court case in 1991 called Feist versus Rural Telephone Service, which involved a telephone directory that put the names of its subscribers in alphabetical order. And the claim was that, well, this took a lot of time and effort and a lot of work, so you know, surely we should have copyright protection for this telephone directory, and the Supreme Court said no. The sine qua non of copyright protection is original expression. It says there has to be originality, some spark, some minimal degree of creativity. And the court held that merely putting things in alphabetical order doesn't fly. Right, not sufficiently creative. So the question is, does putting parts of a statute under subject headings in, in, in ascending numerical order, that sounds kind of similar to alphabetization. It sounds sufficiently trivial, sufficiently lacking in creativity as to not merit copyright protection. Um, and in fact, in an analogous case, the Second Circuit, in one of the many cases involving um, West Publishing, held that the following 
acts with regard to judicial opinions were not original. Um, rearranging information from the cases that specified the parties, the court, and the date of the decision. Adding certain information about who the lawyers were. Um, adding subsequent procedural developments, such as, such as amendments and denials of rehearing. Editing peril and alternative citations to delete obscure citations and that sort of thing. Uh, quoting from the court, it said, West's choices, the choices I just mentioned on selection and arrangement, can reasonably be viewed as obvious, typical, and lacking even minimal creativity. And I would argue that in many states, these, in many cases, these state claims of copyrightable selection, coordination, and arrangement would also fail um, the requirements for copyright protection under that standard. Uh, to quote the late Professor Patterson, they seem ministerial um, rather than discretionary or expressive. And the merger doctrine I discussed um, applies here too in terms of selection, coordination, and arrangement, um, how many ways are there to organize and arrange the law, right? Like, quick, Carl, make a version of the Oregon statutes without the official structure and section numbers. Get creative, invert everything, rearrange them, put section one over here and section, right? It's not gonna work. So again, um, the, 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 the um, expression there merges with, with, with the underlying facts. And on top of that, if we think of the goal of copyright itself, copyright law exists uh, by constitutional imprimatur um, to provide private incentives to create and distribute works in order to benefit the public, right? And are these copyright incentives necessary in the case of laws? Judges aren't going to write their opinions, and legislatures aren't going to draft statutes without the copyright incentive. No, the incentives aren't there. What about the other part of the equation? The purpose of copyright law is to incentivize creation of works so that the public can access and enjoy them. That part is perverted as well, right? The incentives aren't necessary, but they're actually impeding the public access. So if you look back to the, laws of copy, the, the goals of copyright itself, applying copyright to uh, these particular statutes and judicial state statutes and um, ordinances, regulations, doesn't seem to further the goals of copyright at all. So those are two sets of arguments that you find often conflated in the cases. One about the broad right of the public to access the laws that govern its behavior, and the second about the rules within copyright itself. Copyright only extends to original creative expression. It doesn't cover facts and ideas. So we find those in the cases. Um, there is a movement, largely led by Carl and others, towards opening state law um, to fighting these copyright claims. Will it happen? I was talking to Carl um, yesterday. We have a lot of states, um, and they obviously have different stances on this. Uh, a centralized solution would be infinitely preferable than going state to state, probably. What would that look like? Well, there actually was a um, proposal from Senator Barney Frank in 1992 that would have put state laws within the ambit of the Copyright Act. I mentioned Section 107, 105. 105 would have covered, exempted both federal and state works from copyright protection. So that would be a very direct and sweeping way to solve this problem. However, with the way the legislature works and everything they have on their plate, I think it's probably unlikely to pass. Another solution is a judicial solution. Um, say in the Oregon case, uh, there was actually a lawsuit and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, okay, we've reviewed this, and no, these statutes, are the selection, coordination, arrangement, the statutes themselves, the text, absolutely not copyrightable. Um, given the amount of uh, happenstance, effort, years, um, vagaries of the court system that it would take together, that's probably unlikely as well, although we, if we see some cases that could be um, very helpful. And so what we're seeing is this public movement, right, um, this law.gov movement to try to promote states to actually open up their laws, to not claim copyright over their laws, and what would that help to achieve? Well, one of the things is what this workshop is about, public access, and public access not just to the federal laws that we were talking about, Dean Levy was talking about judicial opinions, federal statutes, but State law is a lot of important things. Carl was telling me yesterday that he's put all of California's building codes, I think, 
online, and he gets fan mail from plumbers, right? <laughs> People who are doing renovation projects that are like, thank you so much for putting this stuff on there. I mean, imagine how useful that is if you're a plumber or doing it. If you're just, you know, DIY people trying to fix up your house to actually find a place where you can find the building codes online, right? Um, this, this having access to these state and local laws are just as important. Um, in fact, I don't know why I find this quote funny, but the V quote was trying to come up with things that the public would do with these ordinances. And it said, citizens may re produce copies of the law for many purposes, um, to educate their neighborhood association, simply to amuse themselves, which I guess, <laughs> yeah, not a lot going on. Um, <laughs> In a, indicating their dissatisfaction with their complexities, et cetera. But yes, of course, having, having these laws publicly accessible um, would be very useful. Um, the other thing, and there's a concrete example from, from the Oregon scenario that I talked about, is innovation. Um, Carl said earlier that the law.gov project is about justice, democracy, and innovation. Well, the good news is, in the Oregon case, uh, two months later, in June of 2008, after um, much fighting and discussion, Oregon decided not to enforce the copyright it was claiming in its statutes. Um, and, but they had also noticed, noted, said that, you know, by the way, we, we put our laws online anyway. You know, what's the big deal? We're satisfying the public access requirements. So Carl ran the statutes through the system, and he found the following things. I believe he found over 500,000 HTML errors. Um, he found that they didn't meet the Section 508 accessibility requirements. They had no metadata. Um, they were using a robot text file to keep search engines from indexing. So yeah, they were online, but they weren't terribly useful. What happens after Oregon says it's not going to enforce its copyrights? I don't know if we have any law students here. Ah, we do. Um, <laughs> an enterprising second-year law student at Lewis and Clark Law School set up his own website. Um, actually, I don't know if it's a guy or a girl. Do you? Yeah, guy. Sure. Okay. His own website, OregonLaws.org. And it's user-friendly, and it's browsable, and it's annotated. And uh, Dean Levy was saying earlier today, you know, we don't hire web designers in the court to, to maintain our websites. Well, a lot of state budgets aren't being dedicated towards, to, or towards web design either, right? So why not open up the law and let the enterprising law student or librarian or legal information specialist or web designer or anyone actually create a useful website, uh, an attractive website, a website that you know, people can actually browse easily, um, build a better website. Um, so, first, the public access, the example of the plumbers. Two, innovation in addition to justice and democracy. Three, um, some solution to the copyright claims. Defeating the legal uncertainty would be a particular benefit to risk-averse entities, obviously. There are those who are going to put things online and risk the lawsuit, but then entities like librarians, universities, who might otherwise be engaging in extremely valuable, um, Duke notwithstanding, because we have Dick and Keith, and we do good things, Kevin. Um, but universities and libraries that would otherwise be authenticating and preserving things um, wouldn't have that barrier to doing so, wouldn't you know, feel that they were going to be subjected to a lawsuit. And finally, it might actually be good for the states themselves. Um, I understand the state's concerns. Their concern is that they actually make a bit of money from licensing their purported copyrights to the private publishers. Um, you know, books, the, 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 those books, those legal books can cost several hundred dollars. And so they feel that um, there is a monetary incentive to these copyright claims. And also they, in some cases, say that um, it helps them to be the authenticator, the verifier of their laws. But are these claims really good for states? Um, I saw something that said state employees themselves, you know, the people who often have very limited access to the legal resources that they need. It would be very useful to them to have things freely available um, online. And of course, the state's goal is to offer their citizens access to the law. And so this would seem to be a, a shared goal, the goal of the Law.gov project and the, the, the goal of the states. So, I've been talking about copyright during this presentation, and that's only one part of the problem, and fixing the copyright issue would only be one part of the solution. Because saying something is not copyrightable doesn't mean I actually have a right of practical <coughs> access to it. So the Feist court said that alphabetically arranged telephone directories are not copyrightable. That doesn't mean that UNC has to put its directory online. Right, that's only one part of the picture. And so I would argue in addition 
to, to, to really achieve the goals of democracy, justice, innovation um, that we are looking for. We need not only a change in the law, which is certainly a very useful first step, but also a change in attitude that would promote real, real meaningful access to the law. Um, we need materials to be up to date, verified, authenticated, and released in a way and through a website that actually provides meaningful access to citizens. Um, for example, no digital rights management. Um, you know, you go to some sites and you, sure, you can read the law, but can you copy it? No. Say you're in Arizona and you think maybe it'd be useful to translate some of their uh, new laws into Spanish so that the people who are being affected by them might be able to know that their rights are being taken from them. Can you do that? No. Right? And um, so uh, unencumbered access, unencumbered by things like digital rights management schemes, unencumbered by the provisions of click wrap contracts, for example. You know, just click here and agree to these terms of use before you go and use the law. So. Um, both, both a resolution of the copyright issue and an effort, a change in attitude, and um, a joint effort between states and grassroots efforts towards meaningful access uh, would be a step in the right direction. And this workshop is a step in the right direction. So, thanks. <laughs>